The entrance is around here somewhere. I'm sure of it. A little more light, Mina? Mina Montessario glances nervously around the small shrine and holds the lantern higher. I'm worried about someone spotting us. Some of the muscle running this place look pretty brutal. You're not wrong, Cadmus agrees. But with the fights in full swing, there's not much chance of anyone noticing us down here. We should be perfectly safe. Now, how did Antiope find and open this panel? The pair have successfully paid their way into the blood pits, a set of gladiatorial combat arenas where criminals are sent to fight and die. And under cover of night, they have managed to sneak down below the pits undetected, passing the many dark and stinking cells before eventually reaching the Shrine to Bran. But the secret entrance to the underpipes that Cadmus spoke of has so far proved elusive. Mina wonders how much longer their luck can hold. As if in response to her unspoken question, the wooden double doors swing violently open. Filling the doorway is a bare-chested figure of monumental proportions, at least ten feet in height and not much less broad. A massive head with a sloping forehead, slab-like brows over vicious, piggy little eyes appears under the doorframe, and in a voice like gravel in a bass drum, it speaks. You! Glugak thought it was you, Healer. What are you doing, sneaking around like thief? Cadmus stands, hands raised. Ah, Pitmaster Glugark, now there's no cause for violence. Please, let me explain. A savage grin spreads across the Pitmaster's face, revealing wicked-looking fangs. The eyes glint with surprising intelligence for an ogre. He unhooks an enormous cudgel from his belt and begins to slap it into one huge, meaty palm. It must be five feet long, and it's tipped with cruel iron spikes. Oh, please do, Healer. Explain what you've done with Glugark's prize fighter. Explain why you lose Glugark big money. Explain why Glugark not take these two. He waves at Mina and Cadmus. As payment fighters for my pits and pound you into sticky smear. Hello and welcome to The Lone Adventurer, an actual play solo RPG podcast with me, Carl White. I will be your narrator, your game master, and your guide as we follow our hero, Mina Montessario, on her journey into the unknown. For this game, I will be using the D&D 5th edition rule set, as well as a variety of other systems, tools, and tables as they take my fancy. A word of warning. The following scenes may contain mature themes and disturbing imagery. Listener discretion is advised. The adventure continues. Last time on The Lone Adventurer, Mina was given an unwelcome decision to make by an even more unwelcome visitor. Either follow along with Alexis's marriage plans, or do the visitor's bidding and return to the underpipes. We learned more about the death of her father and about Mina's suspicions of Alexis's involvement. More than anything, it was her distrust of her cousin that led her to the conclusion that the underpipes were the best option. And Cadmus explained that he knew a way in beneath the blood pits. But with that decision reached, Mina and Cadmus were interrupted by an atrocity they could never have predicted. The machine cultists blew up the Ancran Monastery. Now they're more determined than ever to root out the source of the infernal powder and end it. Cadmus swallows. Yes, about that. Mina can see the way this is going. This Glugark has already made up his mind. He's just toying with them, enjoying watching them squirm. The best outcome is probably that this brute will pound them for fun and, if they're still alive afterwards, use them as cannon fodder in his pits. 
they're going to need to fight their way out of this one, she's certain. Still, no harm in giving the peaceful route one final chance. Time to throw some of that noble weight around. She holds up a blank steel badge which projects a glowing image of the House Montessario coat of arms. Pitmaster Glugark, the Devotant and I are on urgent house business. Any interference will result in serious legal repercussions. If you have been financially inconvenienced, your losses will be covered, but right now we do not have time to discuss this with you. Please return to the pits and let us be about our work. Glugark's grin fades and he blinks rapidly. House business? Legal repercussions? Mina, seeing her opening, seizes it. Oh yes, I imagine this place would be shut down for quite some time while the details were worked out, and, of course, that's before the question of whether you, personally, would face punitive fines. Or even find yourself in one of those cells, though I'm sure you'd make a very fine pit fighter. Even as the final words leave her mouth, she realises she's overstepped. The ogre's brows knit together, his lips peel back in a furious snarl, and he growls, You threaten Glugark? You laugh at Glugark here in Glugark's place? You dare? He lets out a mighty roar and charges. Startled by the ogre's speed, Mina scrambles back, fumbling to free her pistol. Barbican, attack! she yells, and the metal man springs forward interposing itself between Mina and the charging ogre, blue-white energy arcing from between its outspread digits. The ogre's club catches Barbican solidly in the torso, lifting him clear off his feet and sending him tumbling across the tiled shrine floor. Cadmus, backing away, calls upon Ankara's blessing, and Mina feels all panic drain away to be replaced by a sense of calm and certainty. Remember your training. Slow your breathing. Still your body and choose your target wisely. She aims at Glugark's broad chest and fires. The impact staggers the massive ogre back a pace or two, the fury on its face momentarily replaced by an almost comical surprise. This puny pipsqueak that he had been about to smash into a bloody puddle has actually hurt Glugark. Mina takes advantage of the momentary respite to call out, Barbican, repair! The automaton's runes pulse blue, and bent and dented metal pops back into shape as it stands up. But almost as quickly as it went, Glugark's fury is back. <laughs> Glugark splat you good! He flails wildly with his spiked club, which misses both Mina and Barbican by mere inches as they back rapidly away. Mina raises her pistol again and fires, this time punching a fist-sized hole in Glugark's substantial belly. The wound would be fatal to any normal creature, but Glugark is a raging mass of muscle, fat and fury. Instead of doing the decent thing and dropping, he instead grips one of the shrine's hefty wooden support pillars, and in an impossible feat of strength, Glugark tears it free. No one shoot Glugark! Glugark is the strongest one there is! Mina, look out! Cadmus cries as the tiled roof of the structure groans alarmingly, teetering unsupported above their heads. Then, with a cracking of splintering wood, the whole roof comes crashing down on them. Dust and debris rise up in a choking cloud, leaving Mina and Cadmus coughing and battered. Glugark, however, seems to have barely noticed. No, Glugark smash you all! The ogre swings both his spiked club and the heavy wooden beam that he's torn free, and Cadmus is unable to stay out of his reach. The beam catches him, slamming into the side of his body, knocking him sideways and back into a wall. He lands hard, his head swimming, his ribs in agony, but he somehow manages to stay on his feet. Is that all you have, Glugark? I expected more than a love tap. You hit like a sleepy kitten. The ogre's face turns purple. No one laugh at Glugark, he bellows, raising both his weapons high above his head in a fearsome display of power. Glugark not funny! Mina rises from the rubble, lines up her shot, and blows the ogre's head off. He stands for a moment, headless with arms upraised, then collapses in a massive blubbery heap. 
mean you're right, Mina says, blowing the purple smoke from her pistol muzzle. I think a career in stand-up is probably out of the question. In the silent aftermath of the battle, they hear cries coming from up above. Their conflict has clearly not gone unnoticed. It sounds like we're going to have more company, Cadmus. If we're going to find that entrance, it's now or never. Barbican, clear! The three of them work frantically to clear aside debris, all the while hearing the shouts of the pit hands growing closer. Mina is about to call time when Cadmus cries, Here! Here it is! Help me open this section of the floor! Together, they pull open a trapdoor hidden in the tilework and clamber into a tiny cavity beneath. The interior of a pipe, just large enough to crawl through on hands and knees. They pull the trapdoor too, and all is darkness. I've mentioned before that in a solo D&D game, without someone to cover all the bases, there can be skills gaps. Well, that point was proved in this encounter. Mina and Cadmus both lack charisma-based face skills, things like persuasion, deception, intimidation. These are areas that in D&D typically the party rogue or bard or maybe even warlock might cover. And they're extremely important, not just for socially focused campaigns, but for simple stuff just like getting past a bouncer. And in this encounter, that gap was responsible for Mina ending up having to shoot the bouncer repeatedly instead. And that said, Mina very nearly pulled it off. Although she was rolling at disadvantage due to Glugark's hostility towards Cadmus, Mina actually managed to give him pause with her first roll. But, in order to get him to leave them to their business, with all that flannel about fines and imprisonment, I felt a second deception roll was required, and sadly, Mina blew that one big time. Q combat. The reason Glugark made an appearance in the first place was because I'd pissed off my virtual GM by cheekily asking for free stuff. By which I mean I'd asked Mythic if Cadmus had been able to grab any healing potions back at the monastery to take with them on their trip to the underpipes. Well, it turned out if there were any, they were either buried under tons of rubble or they were all needed to help the wounded, because Mythic said no. And not only that, but it indicated a random event. Introduce a new NPC with the description Intolerance the Innocent. Well, at the time, my mind had been on the blood pits, and so this seemed like it could only be a cruel pitmaster. This is a risk you run when you ask Mythic yes or no questions. Any one of the answers could introduce a random event. It could be something positive for the PCs, but let's be honest, how likely is that, given Mina's luck to date? I determined, by asking Mythic, that the pitmaster was not human, and so an ogre seemed like a really solid choice. But the Monster Manual Ogre was both a pushover for my party and dull. Thankfully, the Cave Ogre variant in the Level Up Monstrous Menagerie came to my rescue. Not only was it a lot more interesting mechanically than the Base Ogre, but it was an elite monster, double the challenge rating, making it, on paper, a hard encounter. From what I can see in the Level Up Monster design, it takes its cues, to some extent, from the 4th edition of D&D. It's fair to say that 4th edition was pretty divisive for the D&D community, and that it upset a fair few people at the time when it was released. Enough, in fact, to trigger a whole new fork of D&D at the time, Pathfinder. The issue with 4E was, in large part, due to the fact that it was such a big departure from what had come before. But it's also fair to say that the system did have some problems. Combat, for example, could get quite bogged down and slow, particularly at higher levels with multiple conditions and condition interactions to track. But I think what often gets lost in the criticism of 4E is that it had some really great ideas, and monster design in particular was a really strong point. I recently read or heard an opinion somewhere that if 4E had been released as a different RPG other than D&D, it might still be selling today. Well, it was, and it is, at least sort of. 13th Age, published by Pelgrim Press, was designed by Rob Heinsu, the lead designer of D&D 4th Edition, and Jonathan Tweet, lead designer of 3rd Edition. It takes many of the best things from those editions and adds some other great ideas on top. My gaming group recently started a monthly 13th Age game set in the RuneQuest world of Clorantha. Links in the show notes if that's of interest to you. Anyway, 
That little Edition Wars detour aside, Level Up reintroduces the 4E concept of bloodied to 5E. A creature is bloodied when it reaches half its hit points, and this condition can serve as a trigger for additional monster actions, abilities or traits. This can make the later stages of combat a lot more interesting, as the battle intensifies. In the case of Glugark the Cave Ogre, he was literally able to bring the house down on Mina and company, as a result of becoming bloodied and triggering his daily power. We didn't get to see any of these other bloodied features, however, because Mina is now a bona fide damage monster. Her pistol does a base 1d10 damage, her stat and infusion bonus give her plus 5 to damage rolls, her sharpshooter feat allows her to add plus 10 to damage if she subtracts 5 from her to hit roll, and that's partially offset when Cadmus cast Bless on her, which he did at the start of that combat. With that set up in play, it's worth her taking this option with every shot, particularly against lower AC opponents like Glugark. And as part of my house rules, to offset the lack of action economy, Mina is doing double damage. Which means that with all of these in place, Mina was dealing between 32 and 50 points of damage with each hit. Like I said, a damage monster. Even so, Glugark served his purpose. He got some licks in, and used up some party resources in terms of spell slots and Barbican's uses of auto-repair. Let's hope we don't see too much more combat before Team Mina get their next chance to rest. There may be some repercussions for killing the Pitmaster, so I'm adding Carnage in the Blood Pits as another list thread. But the Mythic deck only comes with 17 list cards, and I've already used all of those up. The Mythic Deck Manual suggests that if you run out of cards, you can just add in an extra standard-sized poker card, but I don't think I'm going to do that. I think actually having constraints on the list is probably a good thing, helping me focus on really what matters most. If I want to introduce a new character or story thread, I'm going to need to cull an existing one. If the new thread is not as important or interesting as one of the existing ones, it doesn't get added. In this case, I'm going to remove Make Amends for the Fire in the Spot. Her guilt for that event is already driving some other plot threads, namely tracking down the Infernal Powder and the Machine Cultists, and so the Make Amends thread does feel a bit superfluous. I've also noticed that the Pipe Runners are missing from my character list, so I'm removing Barbican and adding them. With Glugark taken out, and the entrance to the Underpipe secured, the Chaos Factor falls to 5. You hit like a sleepy kitten. Crawling behind Mina, Cadmus shrugs in the dim light of her coat buttons. It worked, didn't it? True enough, Mina acknowledges. And thank you. That was a damn brave thing you did. Are you okay? It looked like you took one hell of a blow back there. I suspect I'll have some impressive bruises, but I don't think anything's broken, Cadmus replies. Though, if we can stop for just a moment, I may be able to see to both of our wounds. He searches through the pouch, and then lets out a sigh. I feared as much. The crop of mushrooms was crushed to a pulp by that blow. They'll do us no good like this. You'll need to give me a little while. Cadmus begins a supplication to Ankara, and Mina takes the opportunity to check Barbican over for any remaining damage. Thank you to you too, she whispers as she works on her creation. You really saved my bacon back there, you know. The machine, ahead of her in the pipe, does not reply, but the glowing circular eyes blink once in response. Mina smiles. Mina, take these. She does as the devotant suggests, and the pair swallow each a few of the restorative fungi. Aches and pains marginally recede. I don't hear any sounds of pursuit, Mina says after a moment. I'm guessing they didn't find the hidden trapdoor. Cadmus listens carefully. He's about to agree when he suddenly freezes. Do you hear that? He whispers. From far ahead of them, they can just make out what seems to be a faint metallic clicking sound reverberating through the pipe. It sounds like multiple impacts, a strange arrhythmical tapping sound, and it's growing louder. Hell, Mina breathes. 
This is the absolute last place they want to encounter anything, crawling on all fours, single file down the inside of a pipe. Whatever it is, it's getting closer. Get ready! From far up ahead, they spot an approaching eerie blue glow. The metallic staccato tapping growing ever louder. What is that? Mina wonders. And then suddenly the puzzle pieces fall into place. Oh hell, tube sweepers! Cadmus, what do you think keeps these pipes endlessly repaired and clean, free of debris and blockages? The underpipes are self-repairing. This place has constructs designed to break down and repurpose foreign bodies. Foreign bodies like us. Barbican, get down! Her mechanical protector crouches in front of her, and she uses the metal body as a firing platform. That's it. A little closer. A little closer. Far up ahead, illuminated by that blue glow, a mass of metallic forms come into view, all skittering legs and undulating, segmented bodies. But their hearts burn cold blue fire, and they're closing fast. Mina opens fire, one arcane bullet after another, hurtling down the pipe, trailing purple smoke. The impact is devastating. Metal bodies explode in a shower of cogs and springs. Here, in the narrow confines of the pipe, the report of the pistol and the explosions as the bullets find their mark are deafening. But the constructs keep coming. It's hard to know how many of them she's destroyed and how many remain. Mina keeps firing, but the survivors scramble past their demolished comrades and close the gap. Barbican, attack! Mina cries as she fires once more, and the automaton scrambles forward on all fours, one arm extended to meet the attackers. They meet with a screeching clash of metal, sparks flying as they wrestle to bring their weapons to bear. One of the spider-like tube sweepers is smashed into scrap metal, but another pounces on Barbican, pinning him down. It brings its glowing blue more in close and begins to leech power away from Mina's defender. Barbican's glowing yellow eyes begin to fade. No, oh, no, you don't, Mina yells, scrambling forward and grabbing the sweeper. She desperately tries to pull it away, dislodging it just enough that the power drain is interrupted. Barbican rallies, his eyes brightening, and he slams his own fist, crackling with energy, into the sweeper's centre mass. The sweeper's six legs begin to thrash and convulse as Mina brings the muzzle of her pistol in close against its body and fires. That combat was a great example of how initiative can really matter in D&D. Mina went first in the initiative order and that allowed her to take out the only enemy combatant with a ranged attack. As I'd randomly established this little battle was taking place at long range, that had a huge impact. Mina was able to destroy multiple enemies at range, taking advantage of her house-ruled cleave ability before they could get in close and start doing any damage. If the monsters had gone first, things might have not gone quite so smoothly. The lead attacker was a bronze scout from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Although it had low hit points, it had a very nasty ranged electrical attack and given that they were crawling down the inside of a metal pipe, I'd have imposed disadvantage on the deck save for Mina, Cadmus and Barbican. And, with its attack done, it would have then turned and run for reinforcements, while the horde of spider-like zankers behind it did their nasty draining attacks. Those creatures were from the Tome of Beasts by Cobalt Press. The other thing that's become really apparent over the last couple of combats is just how much of a damage sponge Barbican is. He only has 21 hit points, so he is a bit fragile, but he has three repair rolls a day that can be used in combat. And, better still, he can be repaired by the Mending Cantrip, which Mina can cast on him in or out of combat. That means basically infinite free healing for Barbican. It's significant and deliberate that there's no comparable cantrip that heals non-constructs, particularly when you consider that the medicine skill in 5e is basically useless. In order to regain hit points, you need to spend resources, either spell slots or hit dice. And that's because, at its heart, D&D is basically a resource management game. Resources like hit dice, spell slots, limited use abilities. Success typically depends on the wise use of those resources, taking a series of calculated risks that boil down to, should I use this now or later? The answer to that question 
is determined by the length of the adventuring day. That is, how many encounters is the party going to face before they get their next long rest? In a group game, that's partly up to the players, who will try and rest for eight hours after every combat if the DM isn't on their toes, but the decision should be mostly up to the DM, stretching the PCs and their valuable resources as they see fit to suit the story. Of course, with a random virtual GM, and with my PCs effectively trapped in a hostile mega-dungeon, opportunities for rest may be hard to find. I'm going to need to be very careful with my resources, and hope that my GM isn't feeling too vindictive. Once again, things went pretty smoothly in that last scene, and so the chaos factor drops to four. The trio crawl on in silence for what seems like an age. Though Barbican is unaffected, the cramped conditions are much harder on the two humans. Knees and backs ache from the protracted abuse they are subjected to. It comes as a blessing equal to any healing that Cadmus has ever provided when he finally says, This is it. We're here. He gestures past Mina to a circular hatch up ahead mounted on the side of the pipe. Between them, they wrestle with the handle, finally getting it open. They clamber out, backs shrieking in protest as they gingerly straighten up. They have emerged into the now familiar tunnels of the underpipes, metal gratings on the floors, cylindrical walls lined with all manner of smaller pipes, tubes and cables. They stand at a crossroad, passages snaking away into the darkness in four different directions. Barbican, what's wrong? Mina asks, though of course she knows the automaton cannot answer. But she has good reason to be concerned. Barbican's normally alert posture seems to be slipping. Even as she watches, the shoulders, spine and head slump slowly forward, and his glowing yellow eyes begin to dim. It looks like he's gradually powering down. Mina is about to ask the obvious question when Cadmus seizes her arm, gesturing at her frantically to be silent. In soundless response to Mina's unspoken question, the devotant points upwards. At first glance, the tunnel ceiling appears completely black, but as she directs her glowing coat buttons towards it, the truth is revealed, and Mina's eyes go wide. What she had taken for black is in fact a deep, iridescent turquoise, and what she had taken for a single, smooth mass is in fact the backs of countless beetle-like creatures. They appear to be inert, motionless. She peers closer, and can just make out a tiny, glowing sigil on the back of each of them. Is she imagining it? Or are those sigils getting ever so slowly brighter? She glances back at her companion, puzzled. Cadmus mouths a single word to her that sends shivers up her spine. Manabane! You have been listening to The Lone Adventurer, a solo RPG podcast played, written, and performed by me, Carl White. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a five-star review or telling your friends. It really is a huge help. You can find show notes at theloneadventurer.podbean.com. I include any links mentioned on that site, as well as my interactions with the Mythic GM emulator and any mechanics information. The story will continue in the next episode of Lone Adventurer. Thank you for listening.